Basically, we define freedom as the notion that individuals should be allowed to do what they want with their lives and their property. In other words, to do as they see fit, as long as they're not infringing on the rights of others uh, to also uh, be free and to do what they want with their own lives and property. If you simply don't like some results of freedom, we understand that. Some people prefer order or security or equality to liberty or freedom. We understand that. However, if you care about freedom, let's talk about what freedom really is. Let's have that discussion and come up with a definition, and then we can rank it. And, it, and you might not want to, and I don't know what your opinions, your personal preferences, ma'am, but some people just might not want to live in a really free society. What else happens in right. okay. <laughs> What's up with that? Okay, so, sorry, right, I'm going to stand on people here. So first of all, thanks for coming. It's, uh, I know that... Uh, <clears throat> We'll have, we have actually more state reps here than I would have expected, given that uh, most of their work is done. Um, although that's not actually true, is it? No. <clears throat> is your work ever done? So, um, but first of all, thanks for coming, and uh, and I want to thank, uh, and we should all thank Dan McGuire, who um, helped reserve the room for us, and who actually bought the water. If you're drinking water, so give Dan a hand. <clears throat> for great and estimable Dan McGuire. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for coming out today, and what better way to start on Monday than talking about freedom. Um, when I heard Jason and Will were going to be in state, we, we talked about doing something like this. They have a very provocative study, which is which of which there are copies on the table. Um, I think by the lady in the turquoise shirt, there are copies, so she's waving her arm now so you can see them. So freedom in the 50 states. So this is a very provocative study, provocative enough that we have protesters on the front steps of the state house, which is only appropriate in the land of freedom and in the, and in the room, which is great. Um, so, uh, which is kind of exactly what we're hoping for. So much of what I do on a daily basis is so incredibly, excruciatingly boring that uh, no one bothers to ever protest me. So I'm uh, very pleased and want to thank our friends on the steps for that. So a anyway, as you can see, the, the object here is to, um, is to have a debate and have something of a discussion about this. And freedom is one of those sort of weird things, right? That, um, if it's something that if it's something that I want and it's not free, it's tyranny. If it's something that you want that I don't think you should have, then it's anarchy. And so we live in this, you know, for, in, to my mind, uh, civilization is sort of this constant tension between uh, between liberty and order, <clears throat> and you know, too much of one is anarchy, supposedly, and too much of the other is tyranny, supposedly. We'll have an argument about that. The thing that I think is provocative about the study, and I'm going to introduce the authors in a minute to discuss it, is that um, it crosses a lot of lines. We divide our world normally into neat little sort of conservative versus liberal quadrants, and you know, conservatives are basically Republican position on everything, and liberals are sort of the Democratic position on everything, and and they're some cases here in which you're going to be, let's say you're a relatively liberal person, you're going to think, oh, they're absolutely right about this particular one, or this particular one, probably in the personal freedom area. And they're just dead wrong about the ones in the economic freedom, or possibly vice versa. In fact, a friend of mine, his response to this study when it first appeared probably a couple weeks ago, does that sound right? Was, boy, I agree 100% with 50% of what they said. Um, and I think that's great. And I think, you know, that's sort of why we're here today, is to sort of talk about, uh, talk about freedom broad stroke. And a great thing about indexes is they kind of measure these things and kind of see where you are, and you can gauge where you are. And by the way, just because you're free doesn't necessarily mean you think some of these things are a good idea. You might say, as a liberal friend of mine once said, that. Um, yeah, it would be great to, uh, I understand you want to be free of all regulation, but to me that's the wild, wild west and I don't want to live in the wild, wild west. Or, alternately, uh, you know, we, uh, there are some people who think that, that some of the more cultural aspects of this, the same thing, they support the economic aspects, not the personal. Well, we're going to talk about all that today, and so what I think we're going to do is we're going to talk a, a little bit, and Jason and Will are going to talk, and there's a slideshow, which we um, fortunately managed to uh, adapt to uh, immediately. They're going to go through that, and then I think what we'll do is we'll take some questions. And, um, and sort of engage in a little bit of a discussion about this. We'll all be polite with one another, because this is New Hampshire after all, and I think you have to be polite in the State House. Is that a rule, Mr. Speaker? Uh, is that a law? Honored in the breach often. Honored in the breach more than that. So I'm going to introduce two people. Um, 
and I'll introduce them only very briefly. Um, Dr. Jason Sorens is a uh, professor at SUNY Buffalo um, and has, a, has, a, uh, has his PhD from, uh, from Yale University. And I mention his degrees not because we actually care. Um, I mean, we sort of do, but we don't care. But because I want to talk about uh, William Ruger, um, I'm going to mention that he got his PhD at Brandeis, which we don't care about, but he went to the same undergraduate school I did, William and Mary, and which is the only real reason he's allowed here today. So um, I'm going to introduce him, and I'm told quite reliably that although his name is William Ruger, um, he has nothing to do with the uh, Ruger family of Newport that we all... I mean, how many people, let's be honest, how many people saw William Ruger and thought, oh, geez, I didn't realize the gun guy was writing papers now. So apparently not that guy. So anyway, without further ado, um, Dr. Soren and Dr. Ruger. Yeah, thank you, uh, Charlie. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here today with all of you. And you know, there's just been a lot of exciting things that have been going on in the state uh, over the last uh, you know, several months. And uh, speaking for as someone who obviously cares a lot about freedom, and uh, I'm really excited to see those things. And I think we have you have a lot uh, uh, you have a lot of thanks to give to uh, Speaker O'Brien and some of the other new representatives that have uh, emerged over the last few years to take leadership positions. So really excited to have you here, Speaker. So thank you very much for coming out. Um, well, let me let me get right into it. Uh, what is the Freedom Index? We've heard a lot about it. Uh, we've heard people, uh, like we said, outside protesting what we have to say. Uh, so what is the Freedom Index? And the Freedom Index is the most comprehensive <coughs> study and ranking of freedom in the 50 states. It's published by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, and like Charlie said, it's available over there in, in print. But you can also go to the Mercatus Center's website, mercatus.org. And you can see not only the study in full, but they also have a neat little tool there that you can kind of tinker with the rankings. Because one of the things we really want to do is to provoke a conversation about what a free society is. And we have our rankings, and we have, or we have our kind of metrics for what that is and a definition. Uh, but you may have something a little bit different. We invite you to look at that and uh, to change those numbers around and see where things might fall out. Because even though uh, we may disagree on what freedom is, Americans are generally within the 30 yard lines of the football field. Um, and so I think uh, people care about these issues and that's one of the reasons why it provokes such a strong response. So what, how do we construct the index? Well, we look at fiscal, regulatory, and personal uh, freedom. In other words, we look at the public policies that impact those three different areas. Uh, and that's how we come up with it. And it's everything from taxes to occupational licensing to gun control to homeschooling regulations to ci even civil union laws. And the first question you have to ask uh, is, well, how do we define freedom? In other words, how do we approach these policies as far as whether they're good or bad uh, for freedom? And basically, we define freedom as the notion that individuals should be allowed to do what they want with their lives and their property, in other words, to do as they see fit, as long as they're not infringing on the rights of others uh, to also uh, be free and to do what they want with their own lives and property. Okay? So it's a very traditional definition, uh, definitely within the kind of, uh, I guess, classical liberal paradigm that our founding fathers of this country and this state adhere to. Uh, so a very traditional American, uh, British approach to what freedom is. Uh, people like John Locke would express this, uh, but also people like Thomas Jefferson and others. So uh, we think it's a very uh, traditional definition that's not that radical in the American paradigm, you know, American, uh, in Mer American history. Now, why study states? Now, for a lot of you representatives, this might be quite obvious because you know what kind of impact you can have on the daily lives of the citizens of the state of New Hampshire. But a lot of people maybe down in Washington, further south don't, south, don't necessarily realize that our federal system does afford you guys and you ladies the ability uh, to kind of set a direction for the state, not only in the realm of, say, personal freedom, but also in economic and regulatory policy. And so we want to capture some of that uh, some of those differences and to see how they rank and how they relate to each other in terms of their respect 
for these various types of freedom as well as their overall sense of freedom because we believe freedom can't be easily sundered, that these go together. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why philosophers and economists have talked about freedom as a whole. So Milton Friedman, Friedman for example, a prominent economist, talked about the importance of property rights and the importance of a free market system even to political freedoms like the First Amendment. Who's supposed to decide who gets the money to run a press if the market can't allocate those resources? Is it the state? And what if the state doesn't like the opinions of you or you or you? Is it going to allocate money to those? So it's really important to have a free market even to have personal freedoms. But it's also important to have personal freedoms because we don't just care about economic freedom. We care about the totality of things that allow us to live our life project as we see fit. Now, in, in terms specifically how we, uh, in terms of the kind of method, what we did is we looked at policies as of um, January 1st, 2009. And like I said, the index is fiscal, regulatory, and personal freedoms. 50% are in that economic realm. So regulatory policy and fiscal policy. And those are both divided 25% each. So 25% of the, of the index is accounted for by fiscal policies, 25% by regulatory policies, and then 50% are personal freedoms. So we weight economic and personal freedoms equally. Now the individual variables uh, are weighted by the number of people basically directly harmed or directly affected, also by the severity of that harm. Uh, we also look at whether these things have been emplaced in constitutions. So for example, gun control rates high on our scale of personal freedoms because this is something that various state constitutions protect as well as the federal constitution. So that's clearly an important aspect of personal freedom that traditionally Americans have cared about. And so it weights relatively highly. And here you can see the, the breakout as far as a lot of the different policy uh, areas. Um, now we have about over 150 policy variables, so this just captures some of the big areas. So this is quite comprehensive. This isn't us just picking out five or 10 policies that we think are important to economic and personal freedoms, so it's just gun control and homeschooling plus how much tax, how many, how, well, what the tax rate is. This is really comprehensive, and that I think is important because Yes, we define freedom normatively. We have a certain approach to what freedom is. We think it's very much within the American political tradition. Um, and, um, but after that point, I think it's really important that there be a lot of scientific validity to the study. So we capture the full gamut of policies. We weight them appropriately in terms of how they affect individuals and how they affect the key things that have been ensconced within constitutions. And so, now you may think that maybe gun control should be one percentage point more important or one percentage point less, uh, and we can talk about the weightings, uh, but this is what we've basically set aside, you know, set up as far as our metrics, and then uh, we've moved then to code the data, which is quite a, 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 you know, a task when you're talking about 50 states and hundreds of policies, it's quite the task to actually code all this data. And then we see where it play, you know, how it plays out as far as where the states rank, not only in economic freedom or not just in personal freedom, but overall. Um, and uh, next slide. So here's how it comes out as far as 50% of the study: fiscal policy plus regulatory policy. Here. <coughs> and you see that the number one state, actually, in terms of economic freedom, is South Dakota. Uh, so uh, number two, and, and you, you legislature legislators should be applauded for this, is New Hampshire. Uh, number three, North Dakota, Idaho, and Virginia. Uh, as far as the bottom five, we have states like New York, uh, Alaska, California, New Jersey, and Hawaii. Um, and I think one of the things that, this, that, that this, these rankings show, actually, is that this passes the smell test, doesn't it? Right? So it suggests a kind of scientific validity here, because you would expect a state like New Hampshire or South Dakota, just from what, what our kind of intuition is, to be higher than, say, New York when it comes to economic freedom. Now, as far as personal freedom here, you see some different states appearing. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see Oregon, Vermont, Nevada, Indiana, Alaska. These are states with a high 
amount of, of personal freedoms here, respect for allowing individuals to live as they see fit in their daily lives uh, in, the, in the personal freedom realm. Now, New Hampshire does quite well. Uh, it's number 11. Uh, we hope we, uh, we can improve, or you can improve, rather. Uh, we hope that that will uh, happen over the next uh, several years, but it still does quite well. So it's one of these states that does well on economic freedom and on personal freedom. So it's not like South Dakota that does really well on economic freedom, but is 39th on personal freedom, so a real kind of disjunction there. New Hampshire is one of these great uh, kind of pinkish states that has respect for both sides, and Jason's going to talk a lot about, more about that later. And so here's our overall freedom ranking, putting these two together, and you see here uh, New Hampshire is number one, uh, that it has an overall a, a great deal of respect for individual liberty, uh, and, uh, and, and again, the citizens of New Hampshire should be quite happy for this, and they'll see it in many ways. There's a lot of impacts that my colleague Jason is going to talk about, that it's going to, not only is it going to affect uh, kind of how individuals here in New Hampshire um, be, you know, live their daily lives, but also what effect it's going to have on individuals in other states. And like I said, Jason will talk about that more. So I'll turn it over to him uh, right now to finish this up. And, and we're going to go to questions and answers. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll just hold that till the end, if that's OK. Uh, and we'll both be up here for that. So thank you. All right, thanks, William. And uh, first, I have to apologize for my voice uh, dealing with a, a chest cold, one of the hazards of being the parent of a young child, I suppose. You got everything. Uh, <clears throat> but being social scientists, we wanted not just to look at the rankings of the states and say, you know, boo to the ones who did bad, or yay to the ones who did well. We wanted to figure out what are the causes of freedom and what are the consequences of freedom. Um, so uh, as a first step at looking at this, we looked at um, how freedom differs in different regions. Uh, we see here that the, the middle Atlantic states, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, do, the, uh, do the worst. Uh, whereas uh, the West, North, Central, which is Great Plains states, the Dakotas, uh, I believe uh, Nebraska, uh, do the best overall. Uh, and in general, we see that, um, uh, and then Mountain is second. So in general, we see that the, the West does quite well. The interior West does very well. Um, and the South, um, while in many ways obviously a very conservative region, uh, just as the interior West is, does, uh, does more per poorly, particularly on personal freedom. Look at the South Atlantic, for, uh, for example, does not very well on personal freedom and therefore just kind of in the middle on overall freedom. Okay. The next thing we, um, I'm just the right arrow. Um, the next thing we take a look at, because we now have uh, two years, 2007 and 2009, we're able to see how different states have changed over time. Uh, Oregon is the most improved state. Uh, it, it actually rose from number 22 to number 8 in the ranking. Um, Nevada also improved quite a bit. Maine, Washington, West Virginia. This is, again, over the 2007 to 2009 period. Um, whereas the states that fell the most over that period were Wyoming, California, Massachusetts, Arizona, and New Jersey. New Hampshire uh, increased uh, over that period. Then we wanted to look at um, how ideology um, relates to freedom. Okay, so as a first uh, step at that, we plot the states on economic and personal freedom. We see that there uh, does look to be a modest positive relationship between these two uh, types of freedom. New York, for instance, is <laughs> well below uh, the other states on economic freedom and it also does quite badly on, on personal freedom. Um, whereas New Hampshire does uh, fairly well on both types of freedom. Some states um, conform to uh, the ideal, um, if you will, of having lots of personal freedom and not much economic freedom, but they might not be the states you would expect. It's not states like New York or California that do well on personal freedom. It's more states like Vermont, Oregon, Alaska, Nevada. Um, so certainly some so-called uh, blue states do very well in our index. Um, but they tend to be the ones that are maybe a little more rural and a little more tolerant of, of different kinds of lifestyles, whereas a lot of the northeastern uh, blue states do quite badly. Okay. Um, here's our relationship between uh, citizen ideology and personal freedom. So on the x-axis, we've got uh, vote share for Democratic and Green presidential candidates in the 2008 election. 
On the y-axis, we have personal freedom. And we've got a scatter plot of the states here. And we see that there's not much of a relationship between ideology and personal freedom, but to the extent that there is one, it seems to me that the really deep blue states do worse on personal freedom. Um, but that's pretty much it. The red dot there, by the way, corresponds to New Hampshire. Uh, and here we have ideology and economic freedom. And here we do see a relationship where um, conservative and sort of centrist states do better than um, liberal states. So as Democratic plus Green vote share increases, we see economic freedom definitely uh, declining. The red dot there is New Hampshire. So as you see in both charts, New Hampshire has uh, more freedom than you would expect given citizen left-right ideology, right? The, how conservative the state is. It has more freedom than you would expect. All right, and then the final chart here, we've got uh, overall freedom. Um, and then again, the, the red dot corresponds to New Hampshire. So once again, we see that uh, sort of moderate and conservative states do better than liberal ones. It's not necessarily that the, the more conservative you are, the, the better. Um, we had expected to find, actually, that liberal states would do better on personal freedom um, and conservative states better on economic freedom. But we, we, what we actually found is that on personal freedom, it's kind of a wash. And on economic freedom, conservative states do better. So on overall freedom, conservative states do a little better. Okay, uh, next, we look at the consequences of freedom on several things that are desirable. First, we look at interstate migration. So here we uh, look at um, mi migration from other states, net migration from other states between 2000 and 2009 as a percentage of 2000 population. Okay, we estimate that as a function of overall freedom in 2007, as well as climate, January temperatures. Okay? And, uh, and we try that, we also break out freedom into economic and personal freedom. And we do find that higher January temperatures encourage more people to move in. So warmer states are attracting people. Probably not a big surprise there. But what's interesting is we also find that freedom attracts people. So for instance, an increase of 0 0.5 points on the freedom scale for instance, from Connecticut to Iowa, increases net migration by 5.9% of 2,000 population. And that's about twice as large as the estimated effect of a change in January temperature of 20 degrees, for instance, from Chicago to Birmingham. Uh, and we can be 99% confident that that is a real effect. Then we break out uh, economic and personal freedom, and we find that um, a quarter point uh, increase in personal freedom increases migration by 5% of 2,000 population, while the comparable effect of economic freedom is 2.4%. So uh, personal freedom actually has a stronger effect on attracting people than economic freedom in an absolute sense. Now, um, you have to bear in mind, though, that there's less variance in personal freedom among the states. In fact, there's about half as much variance in personal freedom among the states as on economic freedom. So, um, so really, the effects are actually about, uh, about the same in terms of the observed variance that we see. Um, so if you want to attract people to your state, have more economic freedom, have more personal freedom. Um, then we look at the effects of economic freedom specifically on growth. In separate analysis, we also looked at personal freedom. As expected, personal freedom had no effect on economic growth. Right? Uh, it attracts people, but it doesn't necessarily create jobs. Economic freedom, however, does uh, create wealth. We look at uh, change in uh, personal income growth uh, from 2000 to 2008 uh, as a function of several things. Um, initial personal income, uh, how dependent your economy is on minerals, climate, education, economic and personal freedom. We find that economic freedom, a uh, quarter point increase in economic freedom, increases the average annual growth rate in personal income by about uh, 0.25 percentage points, which is fairly big when you consider that um, correcting for inflation, average annual personal income growth over this period, which ends in a recession, is only about 1%. So this is a big effect. If you want, if you increase economic freedom by a full point, you'll have double um, the personal income growth that other states have. So again, if you want to increase economic growth in your state, uh, promote economic freedom. Okay, and we conclude with some uh, recommendations for New Hampshire. I'm going to go into a little more detail than we had in the study. Uh, we have these uh, three recommendations for all 50 states. Um, three that we had uh, for New Hampshire uh, were reforming civil asset forfeiture. Um, this uh, civil asset forfeiture is a tool um, that can be used. It's fairly recent, actually. started in the 70s um, that police departments can use to take property from innocent people, actually. 
and to get your property, so long as they suspected of having been used in a crime, even if you didn't know about it's being used in a crime. So a hotel owner, you know, if, if one of your guests, um, you know, I don't know, hires a prostitute or does a drug deal, you could lose your hotel. That, that's how civil asset forfeiture works. Um, it's been abused in, in many places. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any um, high profile instances of abuse in New Hampshire, but the laws are not good here. Uh, there's potential for abuse. And so what we think is that you should place the burden of proof on the government. They should actually have to prove that a person is in some way culpable um, for an offense before being able to take their property. Um, number two, um, when we look at uh, marijuana laws, this might be something that uh, where our um, study resonates more with the left than the right. Uh, we find that surrounding states have a much better regime, right? Society hasn't collapsed in Maine and Vermont because they've decriminalized pot. Uh, that could be done um, here at, in, in New Hampshire as well. We advocate um, decriminalizing low-level marijuana possession and making low-level cultivation and sale a misdemeanor rather than a felony. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is, we consider this to be peaceful behavior so long as you're not involving kids. It's peaceful behavior that shouldn't ultimately be punished by the state at all. And then finally, uh, we recommend uh, removing standardized testing or periodic assessment requirements for homeschoolers. New Hampshire is, has much more burdensome homeschooling regulations than most other states. There are a few that are worse, like New York. But, um, you know, New Jersey has no regulations on homeschoolers at all. So, if, if, and Idaho is, is the same. So, if these states, society's not collapsing in these states because they don't regulate homeschoolers and education systems are not collapsing. This is a fairly small, I think, reasonable change that would reduce the costs on homeschoolers who are already paying the cost for supporting the public school system and giving time to their children. Um, so, we shouldn't punish them further. Uh, here are some additional recommendations. I'm just going to hit on these very quickly. Um, new private schools have to get um, approval from local government. We um, support scrapping that requirement. I think it's probably just an archaic sort of thing that might date back to the 1700s. We don't really see that requirement anywhere outside of New England. Um, number five, uh, prohibit sobriety checkpoints as an intrusion on privacy. Um, number six, uh, remove uh, the requirement for a concealed carry permit to possess a loaded firearm in an automobile. In New Hampshire, you're allowed to openly carry a firearm without a permit at all, so why can't you do that in a car where you're by yourself? Um, so uh, that seems like a reasonable reform. Um, in New Hampshire, the contribution limits on individuals are very low to, to political campaigns, to political action committees, to, uh, to political parties. We favor relaxing those limits. Um, we think we, you get more robust political competition when individuals are allowed to uh, put their money where their mouth is and, uh, and actually try to get their ideas out into public discussion. And finally, uh, we would allow uh, property tax credits for contributions to scholarship funds, as Florida has done and as uh, I believe Indiana has recently passed. Um, so those are some of our recommendations for improving freedom in New Hampshire and really separating New Hampshire from the pack when it comes to freedom and creating more dynamic society and economy. All right, um, thank you, and uh, we'd love to take some questions. All right, I'll just organize. The lady in the back who had her hand up earlier. not a subjective, it's not as if we're asking people how, how free do you feel. What we're looking at is, are the policies that impact these different areas. So we, so we looked at, uh, like I said, over 150 different types of policy areas and we coded the data uh, from a variety of different sources. Uh, so for example, on smoking, ban, uh, smoking laws, uh, we got that data from the American Lung Association. Uh, so a very credible source that collects the different policies. Uh, in some places, we had to look directly at statutes and so forth, but uh, there's a, a, a variety of different sources. And one of the things I want to make clear is that we're extremely transparent about this data. This data is freely available for anyone to use, left, right, and center. Uh, we make it available on our website. We also list the sources where it comes from. Uh, so there's nothing that isn't fully transparent here. 
So, do you, you have another question, ma'am? I guess I, I understand my question. Who determined what was free? Was it your determination? This policy is good for freedom? Yes, ma'am. Or was ma it some other neutral body from outside your study that did that? Was well, it well in a certain sense. Was it a committee of people of different political viewpoints, or was it just a couple of people doing it from one state? I guess I'm trying to say how neutral it was. Certainly, ma'am. Uh, no, it, I mean, we basically let John Locke decide what freedom is, uh, and Thomas Jefferson, uh, and then we basically said, here are the policies that fit with that Jeffersonian, Lockean, founding fathers uh, uh, type uh, tradition. So for example, uh, if you think about um, um, <coughs> asset forfeiture that Jason just talked about, the notion that one has to be innocent uh, until proven guilty and that one shouldn't take one's private property without your consent, uh, um, you know, the, this is not, you know, radicalism 101. In our, in our perspective, it seems to fit and accord with a kind of traditional American understanding of what freedom is. Now, of course, there are different definitions of freedom out there. Uh, we understand that. I mean, we're academics first, uh, and we know that there's a lot of debate about what this. Isaiah Berlin is a famous philosopher that has discussed the different notions of freedom. Um, but we believe this is the best way to understand it, and it's also a way that is ensconced in our political tradition and our political institutions. And so again, it's, it's uh, uh, very consistent with that. Now, what I would say, and I, before I turn over to Jason, I'm going at, on at too much length, I think, here is, um, is that if you simply don't like some results of freedom, we understand that. Some people prefer order or security or equality to liberty or freedom. We understand that. However, if you care about freedom, let's talk about what freedom really is. Let's have that discussion and come up with a definition, and then we can rank it. And, it, and you might not want to, and I don't know what your opinions, your personal preferences, ma'am, but some people just might not want to live in a really free society. I'd be it just. I'd like them to admit that if they say, "Hey, we want to live in an egalitarian world in which we have to restrict people's freedoms." That's fine. That's and we can have an honest debate about that. I just don't want people to say, in an Orwellian sense, "Freedom is slavery." You know that th those type of things. That's why George Orwell wrote 1984 is because he was worried about the use of language, the inappropriate use of language. If you care about equality, that's fine, but it's not freedom. Jason. Yeah. I'm I'll just, I'll just that. Okay. Let's go with, uh, we'll start with Dan, just because he's supposed to. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, one thing that makes me somewhat question the methodology here is my personal experience of living on the Oregon-Washington border. And um, you rank Oregon in the top ten and Washington in the bottom ten. And, and it seems to me that by living there, Washington was by far the preferable state to live in. Um, the Supreme Court in, in Oregon regularly overturned citizen initiatives. The Supreme Court in Washington did not, was much more hands-off. Um, Oregon has an income tax, Washington doesn't. Oregon has a Romney care type deal, Washington doesn't, things like that. So can you explain more why Oregon separated itself from Washington? Well, it's important to note that Oregon's rise is very uh, recent. So in 2007, it's number 22 on the study, um, and and then the the Romney care thing that that that, that, that Oregon passed was after the closing date on our study, so it doesn't come in here. Um, but um, yeah, um, Oregon does have a lower uh, tax burden than than Washington, for instance. Even though that even though Washington doesn't have an income tax, when, once you combine state and local tax collections and look at that as a percentage of the economy, it's actually lower in, in Oregon. We saw a drop in that uh, over this time period. Um, Oregon, um, Washington now has joined Oregon on this, having a physician assisted suicide. That's a positive in our study. Um, so there, there are some issues like that where uh, where Oregon tends to separate itself. I'd have to, to look in a little bit more detail to um, to explain more reasons why, but those are a couple. I want to add one thing uh, too, which in, in, in the issue of, of physician assisted suicide brings that up, which is that. Um, we're stressing uh, what it means to be free. 
However, that doesn't mean that we think that every exercise of one's freedom is actually the right thing to do. Uh, so for example, uh, I'm, I'm a, a naval officer, I'm a reserve naval officer. Uh, one of the things that I have to do to maintain my position is I, I, I can't use drugs. I've never used drugs, actually. I've never uh, used an illegal drug uh, in my life. Uh, unless you count in college when I was, you know, maybe had a beer or two, right, uh, before I was 21. But the point is, everybody's done that, just about. Uh, but the point is, I've never smoked pot. In fact, lots of us think that this may be a bad way to live your life. And that's perfectly fine, but that is consistent with saying that, well, maybe others have a different view of this, and therefore, um, we should allow them to live as they see fit, but it's not my choice. And in fact, we're, so we're not, what I'm saying is we're not relativists. We think that there are lots of things, especially in the personal realm, that maybe we disagree with as an ethical or moral choice, but that we think that should be allowed as a, as a personal freedom in the political realm. Okay, let's whip through some questions here. Let's start with Red Tie. Oh, okay. It actually has Thomas Jefferson on it, although I have a different view of what Thomas Jefferson said that you did. But um, I guess my specific question, I, I represent a college town, which is Durham, um, and we have already had the lowest level of funding for public education, and in the recent budget, that was just cut in half, so we're down to 7% funding for the university system. Aren't you? But I was uh, wondering, you, you gentlemen both teach at public uh, institutions, and the Cadis Center, even though it has lots of uh, private funding, is also housed at a public institution in Virginia, so is uh, public education, especially public higher education, is that good for freedom or bad for freedom? And uh, should it be should it be funded adequately, or do you think that what we did in New Hampshire was appropriate? Um, our view on education is that there's no reason why schools and universities should be owned and operated by government. Um, if you think that, um, we think that certainly children have a right to a basic level of education. Children are different from adults. They have a right to provision from their parents. Um, and so there's actually a good case for public funding of, of education, but we would separate that from the ownership and management of uh, schools and universities. As for whether um, universities should be publicly funded, um, you know, my view, I can't speak for, for William, my, my view is actually that, um, that universities um, probably do not have um, the kinds of um, externalities, to use an economic jargon term, uh, that would justify in an economic sense uh, public funding. So uh, most of the benefits of a university education are private. They're, they accrue to the individual who gets the education and then therefore has um, better earning prospects in future. So um, I would actually tend to say that, um, and this doesn't make me popular among my colleagues, uh, when I say, I want my salary to be cut. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think public funding for universities should be um, phased out. Is that just to <clears throat> quickly follow up on that, is there a measurement in your index that measures education funding? We just look at um, overall government spending. And uh, we do give you credit uh, to the extent that you fund government spending through fees like tuition charges. We deduct that from your government spending. Uh, but government spending is a, is a negative for freedom and politics. Good. OK, just to move people around a little bit, how about the lady in the plaid dress, I think? Oh. I'm going to make a question. But, um, you believe in personal freedom, but you also believe in police and state armies. Um, so who would enforce the laws? And, and armies have a draft. And how would that work? Doesn't the government run the police and the armies? Or the state legislature. So my question is, how does, how does that work? Sure, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, we are we're not anarchists. Uh, we don't believe that there should be no government. We we believe there should be a government, and the government should protect people's individual rights. Mm -hmm. And that means that you have to have a police department. You have to have a military. I, like I said, I'm a member of the military because I think it's important to protect the United States from you foreign enemies. Government. You believe in government. Yeah, I believe in government, okay. no doubt, okay? Uh, now, the important thing within, the, within what we're talking about is what kind of government should we have? What, to what extent should it govern? And in that sense, we believe in a strong, or at least I do, I think I speak for Jason as well, we believe in a strong but limited government. So we, we would not say gut the police, gut the military, um, gut the court system. Uh, even we wouldn't say gut environmental uh, regulations that are really important for protecting uh, public goods. 
Uh, so, you know, I, I think some people could look at this and say, hey, they're saying we should get rid of government. That's not true if you look at the details of the study. There's a, there is a role, a positive role that government can play. Now, people that are on the anarchist side might disagree with us, but that's perfectly fine. Um, we think government is important. Let's um, go to Norm and then... Thanks. Uh, I'm more interested in understanding one of your tables here, where your variable descriptions. And I noticed that on the variable description, if you just take one for instance, a slight debt, which, which is the variable description for state and local debt, and then you look at uh, registration of firearms. Under registration of firearms, you have some numerics. Zero, there'd be a one, zero, something else. But, there's, but under the other one, local debt, you just say state and local debt with no measurements. How, how do you use this thing? And where you have measurements on some of these things and no measurements on the other. Yeah, so the, and, uh, and, this and how do you get your variable name? So the, the variable names there um, are a mouthful. They're just there for statistical analysis. They're, um, they're all unique, and that's why they have those. Um, they start with a certain letter. and that, So this is a key to using the individual spreadsheets where we've coded the policies. So you can open up, um, you can see that if I want to get state and local debt, I need to look in the spreadsheet that's called A Fiscal. And I open that up, and I can look at um, state and local debt. And I can look at um, the, the numbers in it. So state and local debt is simply, um, in dollar terms, the total amount of state and local debt. And then we look at, um, then we divide that by personal income to get the debt burden. Um, so we only include numerics in the variable description if it's something that we have to code um, where, where the coding isn't obvious, where it's not a dollar amount, but it has to be, okay, one means yes, zero so means no. So it's very discrete on those. That's right, discrete variables. <laughs> Um, let's go uh, black and, and then green. Yeah, you're black. I'm sorry. Black shirt. <laughs> Thank you. You say, you said earlier in this meeting that um, freedom is the ability of persons to do what they want, void of harm to others. Corporations are persons under the law, but do great harm at times. I'm thinking of Enron Corporation. Uh, Enron Corporation is not in jail, and Murray Hill Corporation was denied ballot access. Do you support repeal of corporate personhood? Now, that's an interesting question. Um, we believe that associations of individuals ha can have rights in virtue of those individuals' rights. So if I get together with some people and we want to <coughs> sign a contract and start a group, then taking that group's assets would violate the rights to people who formed the group. Now, um, the so interesting this, issue... the same would be true for um, 474, which is the right to work for less bill? Um, yeah, I guess I don't quite see the, the relevance to this, but... Yeah, I mean, if, 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 if the government, if the state wanted to take the assets of a union, I would definitely oppose that, uh, if, that's what, if that's what we're talking about here. Because yeah. that's what I think followed from what Jason said. But, you know, well, there's, an, there's the interesting issue of um, limited liability. So corporations are given a, a grant, a charter by the state to have limited liability, which means you can't go out after the stockholder's personal assets. You can only go after corporate assets if the corporation does something wrong. Um, and so that's an, an item of controversy among libertarians. We've talked about this before. It's not in our study because every state has this. But um, third-party limited liability, if a, if a corporation actually does something to someone who is no way, no way consented to deal with that corporation, we think that courts should be able, in principle, to go after stockholders if the stockholders are negligent in supervising management. Um, let's start with Green. Uh, your, your statistics on fiscal policy, but in spending and taxation, are there any states in which one ranks higher or lower in either of those? Or is there a correlation between the two? Well, I mean, can a, can a state score high on your taxation freedom and low on your spending freedom? It's, it's possible, and uh, I mean, there's a strong correlation between the two, obviously, uh, because of balanced budget requirements in the states. Um, you have to, um, you know, fund your spending with revenue. 
But obviously states and local governments can float bonds as well. And so some states have um, higher government spending than they have taxation, and it's funded through grants from the federal government or through bonds. And some states actually don't have very strict balanced budget requirements. They can more or less, you know, almost ignore the requirements. So some states end up with higher debt, and so we punish those states that try to fund spending through debt. But those bonds are paid off through tax funds, right? That's right. Eventually. That's right. So taxing and spending are essentially equivalent. Exactly. Okay, so, so what, you was, what you've essentially done is say that low taxes are 25% of your scale for That's right. freedom in America. That's right. We're using, uh, we, we use both taxes and spending in order to have sort of redundant measures of the same concept, which should increase accuracy. Okay, so if I were to do this and just combine the two for 25% of the would not significantly change your scores. I'm saying if you use yeah. one and not yeah, the yeah. other, would the scores change yeah. much? This, not, not very much. Okay, so 25% of our freedom is, is our tax policy. That's right. Uh, could you just back up one slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, number eight. Allows property tax credits for contributions to scholarship funds. That sounds a lot like social engineering. I wonder why you include well, it's, uh, it, it, well it's, uh, it's social policy. I, or, I mean, it's not trying to reach a particular uh, social outcome, um, but the idea there is that um, it's a way of introducing a little bit of uh, school choice into the system. I mean, ultimately, we, we would favor having a complete sort of universal tax credit um, or voucher that parents could use to send kids to the school of their choice. Uh, but this is a sort of a first step, a kind of a moderate first step toward that. Um, it would encourage people to contribute to these scholarship funds and allow more kids the option of where to go to school. Okay, move it. Uh, all right, just a real quick one, because we need a lot of questions. Would you say that it would be a responsible policy for a legislator to assume that your scales and your recommendations are sound policy for an important political system, keeping in mind the interests of all of its citizens? If I were a legislator and I based all of my decisions on your study, would you say that's a good thing? Yes, I would, uh, in, indeed, uh, because uh, one of the things that it'll do is that not only will you be more free, which we think is the, the highest political end, but it also has a number of consequences that will also help the average citizen of the state. So, for example, um, economic growth, the economic growth uh, data that uh, Jason showed earlier that related to economic freedom, that's going to have a, a huge impact on people across the state, regardless of their political views. Okay, so you're assuming that as a legislator, right. I can ignore the social ramifications of implementing your policies. Yeah, it, it, just like with the Bill of Rights, people said, hey, even though most people don't like all speech, we're going to say that speech has to be protected. And so I'm okay, perfectly so, comfortable with that. So moving on, just because we have about 12 other questions, let me over here. Yes, no, you. Oh, all right. Thank you, John. If, if I know that you wanted to be protested, just let me know. I'll be happy. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you next time. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Dave Robinson. I'm, I'm one of those state legislators. Uh, in this state, we are uh, apparently moving toward uh, eliminating same sex marriage, uh, passing right to work, and we have recently uh, passed voter ID laws. Could you comment on those three and, and how they relate to your study? Uh, as far as right to work uh, laws, uh, right to work is not the ideal policy. Right to work is the ideal policy given the fed fact that the federal government exists and has laws like the Wagner Act and so forth. Um, so it's a way in which uh, it can somewhat uh, remedy some of the problems that Washington has created. Um, in an ideal world for us, um, various types of contracts and associations, uh, in fact, any that weren't directly infringing on the rights of others would be allowed. And therefore, you could imagine an employer and a union agreeing to a certain type of arrangement that uh, right to work uh, would prevent. 
Um, but we don't live in that world. And that's another thing about our recommendations here, is that these are recommendations that are based on the data of the study and the guiding philosophy of the study, but these are recommendations that we think for all of the 50 states are things that are gonna move the ball forward. Are they the ideal for us? No, like you said, you know, we're in favor of, of full school choice. Um, but these are things that it can hopefully move the ball forward in New Hampshire and other places. Yeah, on, um, <clears throat> so on uh, same-sex marriage, um, our, our view is actually that, that the state should not be involved in licensing marriages, that it should be considered as a, as a contract and enforced as a contract. Um, we, uh, so states that have same-sex civil unions or marriage do, however, do better than in our index and states that do not because uh, it's good for the state to recognize these contracts so people do make them, whatever you call them. Um, on the voter ID law, uh, I don't think that's a freedom issue. That's a, sort of a, a good government issue, and I can see both sides of that issue. So to, just to sum up, so the uh, right to work would make us go up, up in the freedom, the repealing same-sex marriage would make us go down in the freedom, and voter ID doesn't have an effect one way or the other on the freedom. Yeah. So, which, by the way, also answers the one guy's question about should you base all your laws on this because some things aren't covered. Sure, sure, that's true. So I'm going to uh, ball gun her room. Well, then. That would be good. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't. That's, no, that's how I distinguish yeah, yeah. myself, too. That's okay. right. uh, I, let me just preface this. I, I, I just have a, a, a bone to pick with, uh, with Professor uh, Ruger. Uh, and, and let me just preface this. I, I've written, I've been a blogger in the answer, I've written political columns for a long time. I wrote on a, on a, a New Hampshire side, or mostly a very right wing. A website with lots of libertarian views and uh, some free staters who are on the site. So, so we, I've discussed freedom for many years uh, in a serious manner. And you made a statement a, a few minutes ago that I would just like to tell people that if you don't believe in freedom, to just stand up and stand by you, because that's really offensive. That's personally offensive to me because that isn't what's going on here. It isn't you guys believe in freedom and those of us that protested. That's really offensive. So let, let me just, we can file that, okay? I'm not mad at you, but I just want to point that out. That, that's, that's, uh, that's really biased. I'd like to speak to the validity of this study. You portrayed yourself, you said you're academics first, and we have we're two professors, two PhDs. Uh, you teach at, at, at SUNY, a public uh, institution, and paid by taxes, by the way, that uh, you call slave labor. Slave wages, I, uh, I got a quote. <laughs> I, I have it here, Jason, and uh, so uh, essentially, uh, by your own definition, you're paid by slave wages. I find th this particular study, uh, I, I don't see any scientific rigor here. And let me quote Einstein. Einstein said that, uh, something to the effect, that, uh, that if I had a year to solve a problem, I'd spend 10 months defining the problem and two months solving it. And I think the problem we're discussing here is freedom. The freedom, the way you could define freedom is your own definition, you know, by your own admission. If this came from the American Enterprise Institute or something, this wouldn't bother me. I'd go, well, it's their, their propaganda. We have ours. You know, we have our think tanks. But this has all the trappings of, of being a, a, an intellectual uh, exercise, a study, a scientific study uh, and with some academic rigor. You have characterized, you just kind of glossed over freedom, like, oh, it's John Locke and it's, and it's Thomas Jefferson. And my problem with that is, you, 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 and you spoke about the 30-yard lines, well, we are far, far apart on, on our definitions of freedom. And to say that your idea of freedom isn't radical is ridiculous. When David Pope, who funded, funds the Mercator Center, uh, was running for vice president in 1980, uh, William Buckley, a conservative, said that he called that his that agenda, which is almost precisely your agenda, he called it anarcho-totalitarianism. So I don't think that anarcho-totalitarianism, especially by a prominent conservative's definition, not mine, I don't think that <coughs> represents anything <coughs> close to the ballpark of freedom. I would say that this this it, what you've done is you've you you're measuring your conception of freedom. So so right from the get-go, the, the premise of this is, is invalid, and I, don't, and I don't know why should we take the results uh, seriously. Thanks. Sure. Well, it, it, th thank you for your comments. Uh, I mean, one of the things I talked about at the beginning, right, is that 
I recognize that there are a variety of different definitions of freedom. My point about freedom versus order versus equality is that, yes, while there are different definitions of freedom that are out there, and I recognize them, um, in some cases what you have, though, is people trying to substitute a different concept for what freedom is, even among those different types of definitions, I think you could say. Uh, and I'd rather be more explicit about making sure we carefully define these different types of concepts and then go from there. And we could, of course, have, have a dispute about this. I mean, part of the reason for this study, and, and, and let's face it, this is not the AI putting a, a study out there and saying, don't dispute it. We invite people actually on our website at the Mercatus Center to actually in include their own rankings or, or own uh, kind of weightings of the variables. So we're explicitly saying we understand people could disagree about that. Um, that being said, and one of the reasons I mentioned is I'm, I'm extremely worried about us getting um, caught in a game in which we say A, um, but we mean B. Uh, so if you think about the term liberal, for example, I mean, I don't care if you're a progressive or a new dealer or libertarian or a liberal, but uh, as an academic, I think words matter. And um, one of the things that happened in the time in our history, this is why we have to say things like, well, I'm a liberal, but I'm not a Mike Dukakis liberal or something like that, is because um, these words have been used as political weapons in a way. And I, I think we should all be unhappy with that, no matter what part of the spectrum we're on. It's like conservative. What does a conservative mean? And if you went to England, a conservative would mean something really different than, than here. What we're trying to say is, and this is why we define what freedom is in the study, is here's what we think freedom is. We think free, our definition is not radical, is indeed very much similar to the, the tr typical definition of freedom that has been used in the United States for most of its history, if not all. And we think that then we can, and then we can scientifically measure how the states rank based on that definition. Is that to say that this isn't a normative study? Of course not. This is clearly a normative study because we're saying how free are they? That's a normative concept. But you can study normative concepts scientifically. So let's say we got together and said, hey, we, we're going to define equality as X, and then we're going to look at how the states rank based on equality. The study of whether they are equal or not is the science part of it. And I think you would admit that. If an economist wanted to put together a study and said, hey, how do we uh, measure equality and, 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 and then who's, which states or which countries are, are more or less equal, I think we could all agree that that part of it could be done scientifically. Now, science is very difficult, as you well know. And, so, and, and, and there are decisions that have to be made. Uh, and we do that. But I don't, I mean, if you want to charge me, us, as, as guilty as uh, people who believe in a very traditional definition of freedom, we're guilty. Um, however, we're not cooking the books. Uh, I mean, we just want to see how the states rank uh, and how they line up. So yeah, normative indices are used all the time in social science. Indices of democracy, indices of human rights. I mean, everyone, you know, and, 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 and to defend the 30-yard line comment, I mean, no one here believes that uh, the government should be able to uh, just uh, beat and kill people without judicial process, right? And that goes on in a lot of, in a lot of the world. So we need to be clear about, you know, we're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, really serious, deep violations of freedom. We all agree on, on freedom to that extent. Um, so, so, yeah, normative indices are used in the discipline. This is, this is just like that. Um, and I, I don't think our de definition of freedom is off the wall. I mean, New Hampshire is not an anarcho-totalitarian state. But if our definition of freedom is really off the wall, yeah. then New Hampshire and South Dakota should be total dystopias. <laughs> but the, the fact is, Americans do like freedom as we define it. That's what we find. Americans vote with their feet for freedom as we define it. Well, New Hampshire, and I can't speak to South Dakota, but then um, uh -huh. let's start with Seth and then move back. So, um, looking at the, going back to the variables, I see variables that um, somebody is I'm wondering, are they negative variables that if it has this, that you're basically you're basically weighting it down, other ones are positive. That's not particularly reflected in this list. Is that on the spreadsheet? And and then following up on that, what changes since this is the second study you've done, what changes did you discover from doing the first one? You said, Oh, that's a someone pointed out there's a flaw in it, there's a, there was something you missed. Um, what what were the improvements? 
from this one over the last one? Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's not, uh, and that's a good suggestion actually for a future version showing, you know, what, um, whether a variable relates negatively or positively to freedom. It is obvious in the spreadsheets because we adjust them so that on the adjusted variable for all of these, positive means it's better. Um, uh, improvements, well, uh, some improvements, for instance, we um, changed the way we approach environmental laws. In the first index, we had included uh, some environmental laws as negatives for freedom, and then we thought about more and realized, actually, there's a good case to be made that, um, I mean, obviously, we believe in regulations on pollution and things like that, but even things like endangered species laws, wetlands regulations, they can go overboard, but there's a potential rationale for them. So simply having these things in place doesn't mean that you're less free. So we just remove those uh, from the index. Um, can you think of any others? Yeah, that was the big one. Really. That's a big one. Uh, well, actually, we also included uh, uh, same-sex unions because we wanted to make sure we, we uh, understood that people should be free to contract all people, uh, and the state should recognize those contracts. Uh, so we included that. Is there a difference in score between civil unions and same-sex marriage? Or are they no, you don't get any extra points for ha in our study for having marriage compared to having same-sex unions. Uh, the key is that the state recognizes, no matter what it's called, it recognizes um, that contract. Uh, Blue Sport Code. Yes. Thank you, uh, Barry Palmer, representative from Nashua. To get away from ideology for a minute uh, and go back to uh, freedom and migration that you were talking about. Uh, the people I have known who have migrated uh, to another state. Most of the time it was either looking for a job or else they were look, trying to find a state such as New Hampshire, Tennessee, or Florida that has no income tax. How did you determine that they're going also for freedom as you described it? I don't, how do you determine that's the reason why they're, they're going there? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So. Um, <clears throat> we, the way we do that is to separate out economic and personal freedom because economic freedom could attract people simply because businesses like it and so they create more jobs in those places with more economic freedom. Uh, so that's certainly a possibility. We, since the study has come out, we've been creating a, a, um, a more complex structural model to tease that out. And we, what we find is that economic freedom has both effects. It creates more jobs, it attracts people that way, but it also tends to attract people for its own sake. And so there's some survey evidence, for instance, uh, that uh, something like 56% of um, former Massachusetts residents who now live in New Hampshire said they moved because of too high taxes in Massachusetts. So there's some evidence that people move for that. But then personal freedom uh, doesn't create jobs. It doesn't create, um, uh, it doesn't hurt jobs either. But it, but, so the effect of personal freedom on migration presumably reflects people moving because they're attracted by at least one of these personal freedoms. They probably are not doing studies like this and, and trying to rank all the states or whatever, but there might be one particular thing that they're interested in, being able to homeschool, being able to um, you know, uh, have um, a, a handgun, uh, things like that, that, that attract them. Same sex partnerships are definitely, um, I'm sure that gay couples move from states that, that uh, don't recognize their relationships to those that do. Good, I'm gonna uh, lady in the yellow sweater and she's gonna be the last one. I'm just a single citizen, and um, I just was, uh, I'd be very interested to see how some of your measures um, in a very independent and unbiased uh, research program would, uh, or project, would correlate to uh, happiness indexes, um, to economic health in a, in a much broader way, uh, or actually with a lot more specific measures than what you have here. And in terms of some kind of um, educational index of success that, you know, competing in the global economy and, and we hear, you know, where we score on science and math and all of that, and, you know, what, what does some of the, the kinds of things that you're promoting regarding um, freedom in the educational setting, how does that really play in how we function in the, in the global uh, arena? Yeah, those are very good suggestions. We'd like to take them all on board for the next edition. There, I, I should tell you, there is a happiness index. There's, a, there's a, a someone that, I don't know how you do that, by the way, how you rate happiness, because I know with me it depends on the day. 
but the, um, but they, they uh, rate things, and Denmark is apparently the happiest country in the world. Um, so I don't know, all those cheese Danishes, I think. Um, but, uh, Will said they're happy to take more questions, so I'm going to start uh, with the gentleman on the back wall. Uh, thanks very much. Who uh, needs a shave? Andrew News, uh, Representative Derry, uh, the gentleman in front of me asked earlier about uh, how legislators are supposed to interpret uh, this study. The so one thing I'm particularly interested in is on page 9, table 2, your regulatory policy ranking, the answer is quite terrible at number 18 there. Uh, I would like to know what makes us 18 number 1 and what do we need to repeal to make us number 1 in that category. Um, well, one of the big issues there, and um, I'll look at some, some more data here in a moment, but um, occupational licensing, I know, is, is pretty severe in New Hampshire compared to other states. Um, what economists have found, um, academic economists like Morris Kleiner at Princeton, they found that um, in most occupations, licensure, that is having to pass examinations and pay uh, fees and usually continuing education requirements in order to be able to do business at all in a state, those uh, simply keep out competition. That the purpose of those is to raise prices to the consumer, raise profits for the producer. Um, so that's something to be uh, a bit concerned about um, in New Hampshire. It has uh, higher occupational licensing than a lot of other states. Yeah, let me, let me add something on that, especially for, from our, our friends, uh, maybe from the blue side of the table, which is uh, Matt Iglesias, who's a uh, progressive blogger at Think Progress, not exactly an anarcho-libertarian organization, uh, has talked about how occupation, occupational licensing uh, is really quite bad, uh, particularly uh, for people at the lower, lower income levels. And so that's one of those areas where I'd like to see uh, a kind of uh, alliance between some of the different groups represented in this room in which we can improve economic freedom, uh, we can improve economic growth from these types of things, but we can also help out some of the members of these professions that want to, or they're not in the profession because they're, they're kept out or they're, or they're restricted, to help them get, a, get an entryway onto the ladder of the American dream. Uh, and so I think that'd be wonderful if we can get that kind of coalition together. Um, and I think that's one of the, I think our messages here is that we want to have a conversation about freedom, but we also, want to encourage people who might agree on some of the things we're talking about to come together and to make uh, a kind of policy changes that can impact uh, uh, the citizens of New Hampshire uh, quite broadly. There's a great, uh, I'll go to the lady in blue in a second, there's a great story about, there's a, uh, I think it was in Georgia, that came out recently, there's a lady who was braiding hair without a license. And you know, God forbid, and no one really minded for a couple of years and then the person in the shop down the street found out about it. And uh, she complained to the licensing board. They shut the lady down, and everybody in that neighborhood who needs their hair <laughs> braided. I don't know why you need your hair braided, but apparently people do when you can't do it yourself. Wasn't there a behind fish you? pedicure yeah. issue here in New Hampshire? In New Hampshire, a few years we had back? a fish pedicure issue. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what the state was worried about you can, there. You can but. have fish pedicures, but you have to sterilize them between uses, <laughs> and that can't. happens to kill the fish. So, um, we'll go with Lou. What is the cutoff date for the data, or when do we do it? Um, what period was the data gathered? Oh, uh, it was uh, you know over since the last study. I mean, we're constantly updating as the data becomes available. As of, of January first, two thousand nine. Uh, so, and that's just a function of doing you know scientific work on on fiscal, regulatory, and personal uh, pol you know, policies, whether you're from the left or the right. It's just, the data doesn't come out in time and so forth. So one of the interesting things is to see where New Hampshire and other states will be based on some of the changes that have occurred over the last two years. I mean, my expectation is that New Hampshire will actually, you know, jump up in terms of, and they're obviously not going to go from number one to number one with a star, right? It's not spinal tap here. Uh, but nonetheless, we think that it can actually set the bar higher. And you know, if, the, if the speaker was here, you know, I, I'd say, I'd say, you know, this is one of the great things that New Hampshire can do for all of the other states. I'm not from New Hampshire. I'm not a member of the Free State Project. I'm someone from Texas, and it'd be great, and I said this on Fox News a couple weeks ago, it'd be great if Texas, for example, would do things that New Hampshire is doing, that you guys can set the bar here for the other states. Sorry. This, that was a, a preface to what my, my real point is that New Hampshire was already doing pretty well in terms of as exemplified by the data. 
but yet to see the bills that have been passed this year, you'd think that we were way, way down the list. And that's my main concern. I think that New Hampshire was striking some kind of a balance in terms of conservative, liberal, dealing with the externalities that we have to deal with these days. And I just feel that um, the state, I, I worry about this study if it's taken the wrong way, that we have to, you know, we have to, we have to do so much more at this point. Yeah, we well, just, we've just come so far in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the average New Hampshire voter right now is not very pleased. And you know, I leave it to the voters of New Hampshire to decide whether the representatives here and other places are doing their job. Um, now, if they said something and they did it and the voters punish them for that, then that's too bad because they said what they were going to do from what I understand. But um, I guess I'd echo something that Jason said, which is that when we talk about New York being the least free state and New Jersey being the least free state, again, we're not talking about these places being totalitarian systems like Stalinist Russia. Nor are we saying, however, that New Hampshire is perfect. We think New Hampshire and South Dakota and Idaho and Indiana, these states that rank highly, they have a lot of room to grow, that they can set the bar higher. They can make New Hampshire a freer, better place for the citizens of New Hampshire and the people who are voting with their feet to come here because it's such a great place. New Hampshire is great. It's, this is a wonderful state. I think it's one of the best places in the Union to live. Um, and but it can itself can be better, and it can do worse as we as we've seen. It's also this. This is a very complex world we're living in now. You know, it's the free state philosophy. I mean, I there are parts of it that I embrace. I really do, but I just think it's naive. And I think New Hampshire becoming a a test testing ground for it. Um, it's it's just. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I respect your opinion, I mean, the, and I agree with it. The world is a complicated place. Um, and we can disagree, disagree about what values we think are most important that should be ensconced in the political system. So I, 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 I appreciate your, your thoughts. Can I, I want to, if I can, just interject something along those lines. And I think that you know, every public policy measure, study, paper, whether, whether AEI does it or or the Mercatus Center does it, or, or some schmo in New Hampshire does it, um, <laughs> is, a, um, is, a, is meant to be a tool. And it's not meant to be a prescription or a diktat or anything else. And I, think, I think in looking at this, one of the things you should look at is not to say, geez, let, you know, let's say we lived in you know, some state that's like 18th on the list. The legislators in that state shouldn't sit there and go, we need to be 17th. And anything that moves us up a notch is a good thing. I mean, in New Hampshire, for example, and in, in we talked about it this session, this last year, there are things that the legislature did that will move us up, and there are things that the legislature did that will move us down. Realistically, though, each one of those individual actions needs to be evaluated on its own. And I think that, by and large, they are. I mean, I don't see uh, very many instances where a state rep sits there and goes, well, I bet this will make our numbers better. That would be silly. <laughs> but one of the things you can do is say, look, these people have amalgamated a lot of a whole cluster of thoughts. And in addition to the, the big giant cluster, they have four separate pods of clusters. And what is driving us, like Andrew said in the back, you know, what's causing us to be 18th there? Well, you know what? There's going to be some regulatory things here where you think, geez, why are we regulating fish pedicures? That's insane. And that's probably not one of your questions. <laughs> But it's a, it's a uh, professional licensing. That's insane, we're going to regulate fewer. But you know what, I'm still going to regulate some. Maybe I'm going to make it OK to do interior design without an without a official interior design thing. But I'm going to still make a doctor pass the bar, or the, not the bar, a, a doctor um, <laughs> license. be licensed and go to med school. Yeah, we're going to make doctors pass the bar, too, because it'll help with <laughs> <laughs> that. But, but anyway, about so practice costs. everything's a tool, and everything's in. Anyway, keep going. Lady by the door. Thank you. Um, just a thought, this is my mind. We were mentioning the freedom and how free people are. Was, in your study, was it ever discussed about people's um, feeling of safety? as a measure of freedom. Let me give you an example from my own personal life. About 25 years ago, my husband and I bought a lovely old house on land surrounded by state parks. We were looking for peace and quiet. We lived on a class five dirt road, um, which if you, you may know, town maintained, but it's dirt. Um, thought we had found Nirvana 
until the first weekend when uh, 37 off-road vehicles roared down the road. We had children, we had pets, they went fast. We tried many ways of asking them to please slow down. Uh, my husband was hit by one. We didn't feel safe anymore. So whose freedom wins out in a case like that? My, my husband, my family's freedom to live like we wanted to live, or the off-road weekend, off-road vehicle riders who have freedom to use the road? Well, that's a great question, yeah. Yeah, I, um, yeah. so the, our study doesn't measure all indicators of freedom. It only looks at where um, governments impinge on individuals' ability to, to do things peacefully. It doesn't look at uh, where government, the efficacy of government in protecting people, which we believe is also important. It's just difficult to measure. Uh, and that's why we didn't would, include it. Would you, would you say that the government had a right to stop those off-road vehicles? Potentially, you know, homes? set a speed what? limit, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 like I said, we're not anarchists. We think the state has a role to play in the provision of justice and law and order. So, for example, we're not saying get rid of the speed limit on any road or any, you know. So, and how the state um, regulates its parks and uh, its property, you know, that's a matter of, that's not an issue for, uh, you know, that's an issue of, of either law, order, or uh, simply it uh, you know, deciding collectively how behavior should be conducted on, say, public beaches or, or and so forth. So can I follow up with what did happen? We started calling the police. Right. We started having shots fired. Um, yeah, and, and in our view, you know, that is uh, a negligent use of a, of a firearm, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> And your, you know, your obviously your rights are being threatened and violated. So, yeah, we believe again. I guess I conclude by saying we think this is a proper role for government, and obviously law and order is an important aspect of that. And therefore, we sympathize with your plight. I'm going to leave you with this. There are a lot of a lot of people still have questions, and they're not going anywhere unless somebody's got an early flight. So please feel free to come up and uh, praise, harangue, harass, ask more questions. But we're going to leave it there, and people should feel free to leave. A um, couple, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we bought coffee, but because this is the finance committee room, the coffee is in the room around the corner down the hall. And I wish you would drink it, because otherwise I'll throw it away. Um, and, and Jason and I will go over to room 209 and, and answer oh, questions and yeah. uh, eat and drink with you, because uh, at the end of the day, we got to live together, so let's have a good conversation. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Let's give them a little round of applause. And I, I don't think our de definition of freedom is off the wall. I mean, New Hampshire is not an anarcho-totalitarian state. But if our definition of freedom is really off the wall, yeah. then New Hampshire and South Dakota should be total dystopias. <laughs> but the, the fact is, Americans do like freedom as we define it. That's what we find. Americans vote with their feet for freedom as we define it.